uh, this is a late evening uh, talk about my Nipissing rider's jacket. As you can see, I'm in my lovely 1970s leather tourney chair, which I really enjoy. I'll try not to turn too much. As usual, before I do the video, cheers to all you people locked in. Uh, I like to say a shout out to all the people that made the stuff I'm wearing. So today I'm wearing my Viberg Himmel Collaboration Engineer Boots with Horween Horsebutt. Thanks Nick, Horween, Brett, uh, Himmel Brothers sweatshirt, Himmel Brothers t-shirt, Knickerbocker hat, great brand out of New York. Uh, these glasses were made in Detroit out of recycled Flint, Michigan water pipes, but I can't remember the brand, they were a gift. And uh, free note cloth jeans, Pertolas, which are my favorite jeans. I wear them out and I send them back. So thanks all you guys for all your hard work making all that nice stuff. So, <coughs> excuse me. Today we're going to talk about the Nipsing Rider's Jacket. As always, I like to tell stories about why and how I made the jackets, what techniques went into designing the jacket. Mm. Not a bad glass of wine. Uh, and the leather and the materials and the process. So this, this here is a Nipissing rider's jacket. I don't know, it's probably not a great shot, but we'll, uh, we'll have some nice, better shots. Couple things. First thing, the name, Nipsing, is a lake. Uh, it's occupied by the First Nations Nipsing tribe, Ashinaabe, Anishinaabe peoples, uh, indigenous peoples, and the reason I called it a Nipsing is because every jacket I make, I try to give it uh, a uniquely Canadian name. And one of the things about Nipsing is it is a beautiful, mostly shallow lake that's at the headwaters of the French River. I have canoed both Nipsing and French River multiple times. And they are a vast river and lake network for indigenous peoples and fur traders and also spectacular canoe routes. So if you think of jackets and you think of motorcycle jackets and you think of travel and you think of trade, certainly it's an apt metaphor. Also, uh, there's a real interesting immigrant story to the design of this jacket. So the jacket itself is a melange, if you will, a bricolage of many different ethnicities and histories coming together for someone to ride a motorcycle. So great name, Nipsing, also sounds cool. So, and uh, brings me fond memories. So shout out to our First Nations people, tribe called Red, Nipsing First Nation. Um, this jacket is made of deer skin. Now we make our jackets in all sorts of leathers, but in this particular leather, this is a deer skin. Um, I don't have any more of this deer skin. I have new deer skin that is shot, killed and tanned here in Ontario. But this deer skin is from New Zealand. This is from farm deer. Uh, it's an apt leather for a Nipsing jacket because uh, deer was one of the main leather supplies here in Ontario for First Nations people and is one of the great leathers that we bestow in fashion. This deer skin is uh, pigment finished. It has a black sort of shine. I'm not going to go too much into this leather because I don't and won't be offering it anymore. But deerskin is notoriously wonderful for its soft, pliable, bendy, 
form-fitting sort of uh, texture and body. A lot of that has to do with the tanning process. So traditionally when you tan deer skin, you uh, dehair it, you bait it, which is to sort of soften it in a caustic, and then um, that gives it a more supple, soft, Napa finish, if you will. Uh, I'll come back to the Napa finish with the story of the design of this jacket. But so, deerskin is a really awesome casual wear leather choice. And it's that sort of open pore, bendy, beefy, full body temper. Temper is sort of the character, the feel of the leather that makes deerskin such a wonder and a joy to wear. In this case, this is a fairly heavy weight deerskin and it was, um, I believe it was an alum tan, so a mineral tan. So it actually would hold up for motorcycle riding, but not as well, obviously, as a horse hide or a steer hide or a goat skin. Um, the design of this jacket, what I based it on, they would have never made any of the originals of deerskin, so be it. So the Nipissing, from a design perspective, is a, a very long and storied and interesting history. The base jacket I used for the design was from an incredible company in San Francisco, California, called Block Built leathers. Now, Block Built has a long and very interesting history. Block, Herman Block, was a German Jewish immigrant, moved out west in the late 19th century. And if you've ever heard of the Menlo District in San Francisco, that was all the block tanning district. So basically, he was a one-man leather-making empire. His main business was tanning leather. I believe, and I may be wrong, but I believe he invented Napa leather. And as an offshoot of the massive scale of his uh, and his business partner's tanning business, they actually started to produce leather jackets. So his last name was Block, so he produced Block Built Leathers. If you're from California and you're into vintage leather jackets, some of the most interesting leather jackets of the 1930s uh, and 1940s come from Block, Block Built and Block Tanneries. So they both provided leather for the leather manufacturing business from tents and garments and belts and machine belts, anything that you needed in leather. They innovated leather and they also produced leather jackets. So, block built, why is it interesting? Interesting not just because of Herman Block, who was a real character, by the way. He. Uh, he became very famous when California was a territory because some local businessmen brought him First Nations, Indigenous Peoples, actual skin and asked him to tan the skin so that they could make garments out of human skin. And he turned those fuckers in to the governor of California, I guess you would call that person. They were arrested and he became quite famous as a sort of ethical businessman who turned in these uh, human killer persons that wanted to make weird, sick garments out of human skin. Anyway, that's a side note. Um, inventing the Napa leather. Napa leather it was basically a very uh, soft, sanded, um, suede, top grain suede, and block tanneries create a process for um, tanning 
cow hide or horse hide and then making it very soft in the bait and then sanding the top grain, the surface off with this very fine, fine sort of nap and it created almost a chamois. And so in the vintage jacket world, you often get a lot of um, uh, broken because the leather unfortunately never lasted very well, soft fashion jackets, leather jackets made in Napa suede primarily came from block tanneries. So block built jackets uh, from the ones I've owned were mostly, not exclusively, they made a police jacket, uh, uh, sports jackets. Um, as you may have heard me talk about sports jackets in past videos, sports jackets were for sort of active men they weren't really designed in my opinion for working they were designed for a lot of mobility for hunting riding your motorcycle walking around looking cool and this nipissing it's a double rider jacket it's an offset zip is a definitely a motorcycle jacket now what makes it very unique is that it's an early d pocket jacket that means it has uh, a classic large sort of patch pocket on the front and we've discussed leather togs being the standard for the D pocket jacket and as I have said many times there were hundreds and hundreds of other designs of D shaped or patch pocket style jackets but in the case of this uh, original block built design the D pocket wasn't sewn on the outside it was sewn on the inside so instead of having a patch you had this gun pocket with this cool angular opening for your hand to go in but the pocket itself is stitched underneath the front panel of the jacket and then there are two symmetrical hand warmer pockets where you can sort of when you're not out being sports guy to sort of keep your hands warm in the in the jacket so there's external hand warmer pockets and then an internal d pocket or mat pocket or gun pocket where you would store your stuff uh, in this case the pocket bag is a little bit small for anything bigger than a small caliber weapon or a well-folded map okay so as you can see from the shape it's designed like a classic sports coat it has a longer front measurement like a sports jacket it still has an angular tapered waist but you can see it's sort of boxy if you look at it from the front it has a sort of box shape this is probably not a good example in the sense it's a size 44 i think it's up on my website for sale but it has this sort of classic box shape and then like a more traditional sports jacket has a very wide sleeve so rather than leave a lot of movement in the sleeve with a wide elbow and a narrow cuff this is more of a traditional 30s tubular sleeve which has a little bit of drape to it and that drape gives the sleeve a sort of primitive mobility where in the 40s and the 50s you see more shape to a motorcycle jacket sleeve which was to keep the leather tight to the body right if you fell off your motorcycle and the leather sleeve rode up you could skin your arm and if the jacket if the leather wasn't tight to your body and it caught something as you were sliding you could tumble and break bones so these jackets were not designed for high speed motorcycling these were designed for low speed motorcycling and really they were really more designed to just kind of be sporty so they have the longer torso so this comes down below the belt line if you will and a, a wide sort of drapey sleeve and a wide cuff 
Now, I designed the basic body and the pocket configuration on a block built jacket from the 30s that I own. The chest pocket, I pulled off a very cool 1930s police jacket. And this chest pocket has a classic shield shape. One of the things I like in my brand is using a shield shape in a lot of my garments and shirts. And this, I saw this pocket on a vintage jacket and it was so cool that I wanted to fit it into, I have two jackets with a similar pocket. One is my Northlander and one is the Nipsing. I wanted to fit it into a design. So this is, I guess you would call it a cigarette pocket or an ammunition pocket. Instead of having it down on the D pocket, whereas where you would normally find it, we moved it up to the chest. As you can see, the front of the jacket has a, a classic offset zipper. One, it just looks cool. But two, when it's done up, you get a pretty standard collar. It has a bit of a wide neck. You can see there's a little gap between the lapels. But when you unzip it, you see you can get that very cool sort of uh, double collar, which is why you call it a double rider. And that double collar in this sort of primitive design, and trust me, this is a very hard shape to perfect, to have it sit on your shoulders and neck and still look cool. It kind of looks like a leather tuxedo jacket. It has a really primitive feel to the collar shape. It took us quite a lot of refining. I actually had to refine the collar shape from the first version to the second version to the third version just to get the neck hole right and get that really cool rider's collar uh, down. So it has a real sort of primitive quality to it. And when I did the design and the adaptation of the pattern, I wanted to maintain that primitive design. So we maintained the welting on the pockets. And even though we're using single needle, we maintained the decorative double stitch around the D pocket. Now, what's interesting about this jacket is how it mechanically functions. So it's not a super tight fitting jacket, right? You can see the sleeves are a bit loose. They're a bit tubular. They lack a certain amount of shape, right? Block jackets were fundamentally a kind of formal informal wear. If you can imagine leather jackets in the 20s and the 30s, they didn't really have a place in, in terms of mainstream fashion, but they kind of had a place where they, they were speaking to the gentleman rider, the adventurer, the pilot in early aviation, the motorcycle rider in early automotive and motorcycling where you wouldn't even have paved roads in a lot, in a lot of uh, most of America, you know, until World War II, there just weren't highways, dirt roads. So these guys were perceived as gentlemen racers, if you will. So this jacket is somewhere between a gentleman's jacket and something kind of sporty, right? So you're, you're trying to get into the idea of the design and the guy who's wearing it. He's cool, he's sporty, he's an adventurer, he's a little bit of a rebel, but he wants to look nice and he wants to be considered a man of manners, not ill manners. So it has a very suit-like quality on the front. Now. Let's take a look at the back. Traditionally, a block built jacket would have a center expansion gusset. I don't like center ex expansion gussets per se. I put them on some of my jackets, but the truth is they can cause complications in design. One, they're a weak point. So if you put your arms forward a lot, there's two points where the gussets sewn and reinforced, it can tear. Two, if you have a very curved back, you can often, that gusset 
might pop open or if you gain weight or grow a belly it will pop open and it will look like an awkward sort of uh ballooning uh open piece of leather on your back so unless your posture is straight up and you don't have a belly it can cause design complications so instead what i did is i took that classic hercules keystone back and i put it on the back of this block built jacket i thought it was something sort of artful and beautiful and create created a kind of art deco feel to the back of the jacket and as you can see this is a hybrid of a motorcycle jacket and a half belt jacket so you have that half belt in the back so when you have a longer jacket that half belt piece is what sits at your waist and then the rest of the jacket carries on down below your hips so it has that classic taper down at the belt and then the widening over the hips as i've said in previous videos part of this was about saving leather that you could if you used more pieces in the construction you can cut more efficiently the smaller the pieces the more you can get them from the right pieces and not waste leather on the hide and part of it is to create a real sort of mechanical and corseted shape and feel because leather does not give like cloth so where you have the half belt allows you to create shape of the jacket and reinforcement across the waist where you have this double yoke which is a very european feature the double point but this is an american version with a sort of slightly less aggressive point it not only offers protection across the shoulders but then it creates this sort of easier motion for the jacket because this is a sports jacket instead of uh you know the front panel and the back panel meeting up we have side panels here and in this case just like the sleeves the side panels create a kind of drape so if you want to wear the jacket tight there's a gusset on the side here that you can tighten or loosen and if you tighten it up it creates a kind of drape down in the jacket where it widens around your hip and those side panels don't create shape in this case they become part of the shape by how, how tight you tighten the gusset <coughs> so in some ways this has an architectural quality and it has almost a dressmaker's quality in terms of allowing the leather to work like a fabric and creating the panels and the pattern in a way to create shape so I think it has a really cool sort of half motorcycle half sports jacket quality there are not a lot of brands out there that would make a jacket like this for me it's a little bit of an excess because it's beautiful and it's sporty but it's not the classic overly tight fitting super corseted motorcycle riders jacket this is someone who would be more interested in a fashionable statement piece that they could wear with a suit or with a pair of jeans um, finally and really interestingly i created the same cuff zipper that was on the original block built jacket now in my opinion this is a very bad design on the original jacket but over history it's kind of entertaining and interesting so because of this tubular drapey sleeve there is a cuff gusset but as you can see and a cuff zipper but it doesn't really offer a lot of function because the width of that cuff really isn't tight enough to keep the sleeve from riding up i believe that if you were wearing gauntleted gloves they would tuck under this if you wanted to zip them inside but what's interesting about this cuff zipper is its placement right on the seam if you see cheap jackets today they'll often put a cuff zipper on the seam it's kind of a cheap and dirty way to 
install a zipper without doing the hard work of putting it either on the outer sleeve or the inner sleeve and uh, uh, you can kind of just sort of sew one side onto the leather in my opinion it kind of makes it a little bit weaker and it looks kind of cheap and dirty on a modern jacket but on this vintage jacket with sort of this vintage style I kind of liked it I kind of liked the primitiveness so I kept that and then of course there's a separate cuff piece that you can see if you were wearing the jacket is on the outer cuff which is actually great in a way because if you were going to braid something that's definitely a place where you would want um, a cross grain separate piece so it's just a really basic primitive design but in the end it comes up very sporty and very beautiful it's not for everybody but it's a very cool jacket i put this one on it actually makes me look good hides my fat ass belly so um like all offset zippers you know a diagonal there's only a slight curve to the zipper but as you can see there is a very subtle and beautiful curve to the zipper one of the things that we're really good at is hand drawing and drafting patterns and keeping the beautiful curves the organic curves that would be in original jackets that were hand drafted before there were standardized patterns and computers and it really shows both in the manufacturer and in the way they sit on the body because human shapes are very organic and i feel my curves sort of this curve actually straightens out across a body it looks like a straight zipper but because of this curve when you open the jacket it's flat it looks like a curve but when you wear it it looks actually quite straight and that has this sort of generous panel here that keeps the wind out from blowing under the zipper <coughs> that panel was on the original jacket so as you can imagine even though it's a sports jacket they clearly expected that people were riding uh, motorcycles with that jacket in this case this one's just lined with the simple black twill nothing fancy when I make a stock jacket I don't want to make it too fancy because if someone wants to buy it I don't want them to not be interested in the jacket because of the liner and the zipper is a talon we put a, a vintage 1940s pull on a talon zipper so it's it's quite nice has a little bit of authenticity you have this lovely universal uh, uh, chain zip here with the uh, diamond pull tab which is very authentic to let's say uh, 40s and 50s jackets so we're not always we're not trying to create historical pieces we're trying to create stuff that's fashionable and cool so I'm not too concerned with what zippers I put on a jacket so much as they look beautiful and they function and they're the right gauge and size uh, for the particular jacket. So there you have it, a German Jew who protected indigenous people uh, built this in a tannery that's now the center of tech in San Francisco. Uh, made with New Zealand deer skin in Toronto, Canada at Himmel Brothers Bespoke. That's, uh, that's the Nipissing. It's a perfect jacket. Oh, one more thing just before we go. Because there's no center expansion gusset in the back, this jacket has some really cool, weird design for moving your arm forward. And what Block Built did is they put a gusset in the armpit with grommets for aeration. So the arm has a gusset on the back of each arm, but not behind the shoulder. So a modern jacket or a bi swing back would have a gusset right here, an expansion gusset behind the shoulder, which was held in place with uh, rubber banding. But this block built jacket has an armpit expansion gusset so when you move your arm forward look at this it's pretty cool it just sort of 
has this extra extra leather in the underarm to move the arm forward. You see that when I pull on it, it opens up. And this is what I mean by primitive design. These guys knew they needed some extra leather somewhere for someone to move their arms forward if they were riding their motorcycle. But they didn't know how to do it, so they just they came up with their own design. And so I've included that little design feature in the back of the 